Update 10 is out today for Payday 3 and it brings an end to the first year of content for the game. Yes, I know the second half of the anniversary update comes out next month, but considering the actual first anniversary of the game is this Saturday, you can forgive me for not counting that when I say the end of the first year because it gives us the final DLC as part of the year one campaign, The Bad Apple, which gives us a heist, an outfit pack and a weapon pack all of which have good and some noticeable bad, especially the heist. I have, unfortunately, some very negative things to say about what is a base, a very fun heist. It's a very mixed bag ending to the first year of content, in my personal opinion. So in today's video, I'm going to give you my full thoughts on everything in the update, because Starbreeze were kind enough to send it to me early. So I'll run you through everything and let you know what I recommend and what I don't. But as always, if you are new to the channel or you keep finding yourself coming back, please do click the subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it and help us get to 40,000 subscribers. We're only a few hundred off now, and I've noticed that about six 60% of you are not currently subscribed. So if a few of you could hit the button, it would make a big difference. And of course, I have to say, I will be live tonight streaming the updates. If you want to hang out and see me play it live, I'll be live on both YouTube and Twitch at 7 p.m. BST, that is UK time. But it's also worth noting it's probably better watching on Twitch because the Twitch drop campaign starts today for some American Psycho style masks, which will presumably last for about the next month. So make sure you drop in and get that content via watching my stream on Twitch. Let's start with the free content and get out of the way, then I can do a full deep dive into the Fear and Greed update because it's not too too much in the way of free content but there is a big thing that I want to lead with you could pause the game in online mode now. Yes, a feature that Payday 2 didn't even have. You can pause in the solo mode beta, and if you're playing online and everyone pauses the game at the same time, the game will pause. You'll still notice the gun you're holding will have a bit of weapon bob or weapon sway, whatever you want to call it, but the game is actually paused, don't worry. Alongside it though, we've also got a new character and a minigun. Houston is the eighth character to be added to Payday 3, and I believe this time he is a free DLC you have to download from a store. I don't think he's free in the base game without having downloaded that extra free DLC thing on the store, so Make sure you do that if he doesn't pop up in your game. There's a blank version of his mask, an SP Model 11 variant called Freedom's Fortune, and also his mask from Houston Breakout has been added. I don't know if that was part of the DLC unlock, but it's a 50c stack price for his Hannibal Lecter style mask from the last heist, so you've got that as well as an option. Houston, if you're a fan of him, I think you'll be quite happy with how he's handled in this game. Feels the exact same, bar maybe a bit more of a matured voice. Still has smack talk between Hoxton and vice versa when they're talking to each other. That's more for calling them out. There's still not much direct heist to banter, unfortunately. But in terms of how he plays and speaks and everything, he just seems like the same Houston to me. So I don't really think anyone will have any problem with him. What I certainly don't think anyone will have a problem with overall is the M135 Argus minigun, which is a new overkill weapon that got added today as well. This thing is beautiful. It's a great gun for crowd control. It's really good at staggering and breaking shields, line of defense, and great for dealing with pretty much any enemy, even a bulldozer. If you land a few good solid shots for a second or two on the bulldozer's head, he's gone. I do think the range is not perfect. It is a minigun after all, so you may struggle with snipers, but beyond that, you're going to be very satisfied. This thing handles like a charm. The only thing to bear in mind is that it will encumber you while you're holding it, so you can't sprint. You actually move a bit slower than the base walking speed, and you also can't interact with anything, which makes sense for a lot of stuff, but not even being able to open an unlocked door might be a push. I mean, hell, you could even push it with a minigun, logically, if you wanted to get through an open door. But either way, it's a very fun weapon to use and well worth trying, because I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. Possibly more fun than you will with the DLC guns, but that is not me saying the DLC guns are bad. That's probably the best part of the DLC, which I'll get to. So the only other thing to mention is there's three free masks. You can see them on screen now. A couple of them even have C-stacks as part of the design, which I think is quite funny and quite creative. But there you go. That's our free content. There's not too much, and especially after playing last month's update with the free heist, you're going to feel that lack of free content this time around. But I think with next month's update having a UI revamp and a server browser, I think just quality of life free changes are going to be more notable next month. If you're a Houston enjoyer, though, you're probably going to be quite happy with the free stuff this month. But for the DLC owners, all those of you who are considering buying the DLC now that all four chapters have come out, Let's talk fear and greed and my very mixed opinions on it. Let's work backwards though, because I have a lot to say about the heist, so I want to leave that till the end. Let's just go through the outfits and the guns first. Let's get the outfits out of the way, because you know how I handle these by now. I don't really have too much to say about them because I know they're subjective. You will already have your own opinions on them. The only thing I will say is that I actually don't think they're quite as good in game as they looked in the poster. I don't love this DLC tailor pack. I think it's fine. There's some decent options. The animal masks are really good objectively, but I'm not a big animal mask lover anyway, so that's not really for me. I think the best suit though is the suit with the cable ties on the arms that is basically meant to be a stockbroker version of wolf suit. But if anything, that kind of just makes me want what I've asked for a few times recently, which is for the heister's default outfits to be free cosmetics that anyone can equip in the game. Granted, it would need to be different colors because you'd want the heister's unique outfits to still be unique to them. But imagine a black version of Dallas's suit that you could wear on Joy or a green or blue version of Chains's outfit that you could wear on, say, Hoxton. Whatever it may be, mixing and matching. I think that'd be really cool. And just getting base outfits with a few color options because Payday 3 doesn't seem to be doing different colored 
suits anymore, which to be fair, when you compare to Payday 2 DLC, that is a letdown. Just more variety in clothes and customization would be really, really nice there, definitely. So tailor pack, I could take it or leave it, but if you love it, you know what you can get when you buy the DLC or if you already own it. The guns, however, this is the only part of the DLC I can objectively recommend with absolutely no downsides, really. Well, one small downside, and that being for the Spaz 12 shotgun. Don't get me wrong, it's a great gun, handles fantastically, but this is a gun that was already in Payday 2 and had quite a lot of good customization in terms of the attachments. I feel like the customization in Payday 3 for that gun specifically is a little bit lacking. Things like the Desert Eagle, we'll get to in a minute, has some great barrel customization, like a suppressor that's built into the barrel called the S Baller Suppressor, if you get the reference. I was very happy with it too, but Spaz 12, it's just not got a lot going for it, the TAS-12 shotgun in terms of attachments. Actual base execution though is really fun. It's an honorable recreation of the gun. It's devastating in close quarters, but the damage drop off is quite noticeable in the medium to long range. Natural for a shotgun, but I feel it more for this particular one, but it's just really fun to use. I think it's a really good pump action shotgun. And if this is the one you're looking forward to, I think you'll be more than satisfied. But there are also two pistols. Let's get the less interesting one out of the way first, which is the Jackknife SE5. I think for the gun enthusiasts, that's the browning so i've heard from some of the partners which is a semi-auto pistol which feels similar to a lot of the base ones that were already in the game possibly a bit more powerful or at least more fun to use the recoil control is quite good it's a fairly stable shot but it definitely feels like the safest edition in the group i don't feel like my game is better or worse for having it it exists it's an extra option and i'm like okay cool but the spaz 12 is really fun and the Gostini Viper 50 AE, better known as the Desert Eagle or Deagle, is easily far and above the best weapon in this DLC pack. And interestingly, gives some really good competition to the Bull Kick Revolver from Boys in Blue, whilst still kind of standing out. The Bull Kick was a one-shot body shot that fired really slowly and had a five-round mag. The Deagle started a base eight-round mag, but it can be increased with attachments. And it fires two-shot body shots or one-shot headshots, but a lot quicker. If you compare DPS, the Deagle's probably more powerful, but I like that both have their own unique characteristics. And if you were looking for a really really powerful Desert Eagle, something that Payday 2 sorely lacks in my opinion, you're going to be really satisfied. It fires fast, it hits hard, and it is a really good competitor to the ball kick, which in my opinion was the best secondary until this came out. Now, might be the Deagle, might be the Gastini Viper, I think. I think there's reasons to back either of them, and I think it's really fun to use. I think my new loadout is going to be the LMG, the Deagle, and the Overkill Minigun. That's probably going to be my happy place for my guns and loadouts for loud builds. I think that's a really good blend, so really happy with that. I can't recommend the weapon pack enough, and then that's the best part of this DLC by a landslide. But then finally, we have to talk about the heist, and I'm going to try and be as cheery as I can about this, because... I feel like I might be being dramatic in saying this, but this heist is really fun in map design and some of the objectives that they do. But there are some design choices in this that absolutely baffle me and just make it nowhere near as fun to play, especially on replay. I feel like this heist just lacks that replayability that it sorely needed and that Payday 3 heist sorely needs. So this heist is the final heist, as I've said, of the year one campaign. And we're dealing with Concord, the antagonist who sent out the assassination hits in the Payday gang. He's been the kind of threat in the background. I don't think he's been very well presented in the story, especially during year one's campaign. I mean, the cutscenes have just been staring at computer screens. I don't think that's the animator's job or any of the cutscene people. I think every time we get a trailer or a cutscene, they're as good as they can be with what they're given. Especially heist trailers, those things are just top tier. They're fantastic. But I always felt like the cutscenes could have done more. The launch cutscenes didn't have a lot going on for them, but at least we saw characters and got to see some of the mood and setting while they were talking, even if it didn't do much. It just feels like it's been a bit of a letdown and him building up to be this villain that, you know, was trying to get Houston killed. I don't feel the stakes. And so going into this heist, I wasn't super excited. I was like, all right, New York Stock Exchange, this could be fun. But going into it and actually playing it, this heist we are supposed to be removing Concord's funding via the stocks and also giving yourself some money, is pleasantly surprising when you first play it. I think it's a really fun heist that's designed well map-wise and as I've said, has some good objectives. Let's talk about the objectives first and then I'll get into my overall criticisms after that. So, you go into New York Stock Exchange via the roof, a zip line down an elevator shaft, you get onto the trading floor and you're trying to get some information about the brokers you're going to be robbing, the people that you need to get the shares from to remove Concord's funding and buff your own. You go into a particular office, you get information from computer, sometimes looking through classified documents to help you with the hack. You're looking for a USB stick and a safe, often in the same room that the RNG gives you for the computer and the classified documents. And that USB will plug you into the transfer control room, which is basically their version of the Golden Green Casino security room, because there is a favor you can get that knocks everyone out in there with sleeping gas, but it's not nearly as useful because everyone in there is the civilian anyway. You can just get them on the floor. Point being, you plug into the transfer control room and then at different intervals, while the money is building up from the stocks, you have to go onto the trading floor and disable particular circuit boxes 
give yourself codes and put those codes back into the system to keep the money flowing. In stealth, you would just be able to hack them instantly and get the code. In loud, you have to wait a bit for them to process and then you get the code, but it's the same execution either way there. And then once you've got all three circuit boxes done, you pull the USB stick out, the money will keep ticking up until you detonate an EMP. That EMP will either disable the stocks in the middle of giving you the money, or you can wait until you've got the max amount of money, which will vary depending on difficulty, and then you can trigger it. And all the while, you will see the money you're getting in the top left corner via an objective called value exchanged. It shows you the stock value going up the more you play. It is a bit misleading though, because it isn't the money you're actually going to make. I would love a heist that gives you six to eight to nine million dollars, like a payday two heist, but payday three seems to be allergic to giving you very high payouts. Maybe that's a hot take, but I miss those days. I really, really do. It feels like pulling a million in a heist in payday three is a cool thing. So I would love a heist where it was a bit more, but point being, you will see it taking up in the top left corner, but that's the stock value. What you'll get is somewhere between 10 and 20% of that. I think maybe around 15% of that money. There's a maximum minimum value. If you pull the USB stick out and detonate the EMP as fast as you can, you won't get much money, but if you wait till it's fully ticked up, you'll get the most. Only downside there is you've got absolutely nothing to do once you've done those three circuit boxes and you're just waiting for the money to tick up. You just kind of stood around in stealth. That's really bad. But once you detonate the EMP, you go up the zip line that you came down at the start of the heist and you extract via a helicopter, which in stealth is just against the building that you're on, the stock exchange. But in loud, you have to use a crane to move a container to bridge the gap between two buildings and give you an escape from a helicopter across the other building, which is fine. I don't really know why they added the extra step of loud. Maybe it was just to give you something else to do in a firefight. It does give you a more unique escape experience, sure. But that lack of variance between loud and stealth is a big problem with this heist. And that's one of my main criticisms. I'm going to get straight into that. Playing in loud and stealth in Fear and Greed is the exact same experience. It's the exact same objectives in the exact same order with genuinely no variation bar which of the two buildings the helicopter's on at the end of the heist. Oh, and having to wait for circuit box hacks if you even count that. That's it. Even syntax error, I would argue, had better variants because at least then you could go into different server rooms and pull the servers out in the order you wanted in stealth, whereas in loud, you had to let them unlock one by one and then deal them all together. Boys in Blue and Houston Breakout, for all their pros and cons, are vastly different experiences in loud and stealth, and that's great. That's how they should be. But Fear and Greed just feels like wasted potential. It feels, I know it's not phoned in because I know the effort these guys have put into past updates, but on surface level, looking at this heist, it does feel phoned in in terms of the objectives. Oh, they do this, 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 and this. What about stealth? Now they do the same things, whatever, it all works the same. I just would have liked some variants, something different to do, depending on the playstyle. And what makes it worse is, I'm sure a lot of you know from at least watching my videos, there is a favor you can get in this heist. I'll put all four favors on the screen right now so you can just see them. I already talked about one of them, the sleeping gas one, and another one that lets you shut the shutters in loud. It's actually very useful. The one I'm drawing attention to is start inside the exchange, a maskless favor. You start on the trading floor. The objectives are the exact same. Again, you just cut out coming down from the roof and you're able to do it maskless, which makes this heist trivial. Far too easy to do because the trading floor where you have to do the circuit box hacks is a public area. It's a cakewalk to get that done, especially with some rush perks in your skill line. It's just, it's just way too simple. But I honestly wish it being too simple was the only downside it had because for some stupid, unfathomable reason, this heist forces you to mask up to trigger the EMP at the end. You can pick the EMP up out of a box. You can carry the EMP from the box around to the trading floor. You can put the EMP down on the trading floor, but can you push a button with your finger on the EMP? No, apparently maskless, you can't use individual fingers. You can move things, but you can't press things. Sorry, I'm being really sarky, but it's because I'm so disappointed in how this works. You put the EMP down and the game doesn't even tell you you've got to mask up. There's no line from shade or anything. The EMP goes down and you're just staring at it. And you might be thinking you're soft locked until you mask up and suddenly realize you can press the button. And it gets worse because after that, you then have to go up via a zip line that you didn't have to use to come down. Why on earth can't you just trigger the EMP maskless and then walk out the front door like a lesso? That'd be so satisfying. And granted, as I said, you would come out of it thinking it was far too easy, but at least you'd have a unique experience start to finish. The fact that even when you're maskless, it still has to follow the exact same sequence of events is just so embarrassingly basic and it ruins the replayability. It's what ruins this heist in a lot of ways for me because it would be my favorite of the four if not for some of these baffling decisions. I don't get it. You know me, I don't like to criticize unnecessarily. So genuinely, the only feedback I would give is just Give us the varying objectives you did in the previous heist. You guys have done it before, Starbreeze. I'm really sad that that's not the case here, especially with this being the last heist we're going to get maybe for a while. I don't know when the next heist is coming out. None of us do. If this is the last one we get for a few months, it's not the best one to end on execution-wise. It's just it's just a shame. But unfortunately, that's not where the downsides end. Now, I will say the patch notes do list this as a known issue. I honestly just thought it was a bad design choice in terms of the colors because lighting, especially in heists like Boys in Blue, has not been Starbreeze's strong suit and issues that like that I've repeated in Diamond District, for example. But the 
colours in this heist are horrific. For some reason, there is an obnoxious blue colour filter in the trading floor that turns red when you've got all the stocks drained and then completely off when the EMP goes off. But it forces you into that colour scheme as you go into the trading floor from different side rooms. In the side areas in the offices, the colours are fine. But as soon as you begin to walk into the trading floor, everything just goes blue. It's like this is the new boys in blue, but not in the way you would have liked. Even marking things doesn't have red outlines anymore. It's like a whitey, greeny. Honestly, I don't even know what my relationship with colour is like anymore because I'm so confused by these colour filters. And even going into the lift shaft from the roof, I noticed that I have a metallic black and gold gun and it all went rusty as I went through the elevator shaft door. There's just some really baffling colour things that take you out of it as well. So not only are the objectives extremely repetitive between different playthroughs, the colours just throw you off and take you out visually. I know some of the partners had said they stopped playing after a few plays because they were genuinely that jarred by the colour changes and I don't blame them. I kind of numbed to them but not in a good way because I was just trying to get all the gameplay I needed and it needs fixing. Just get rid of the filters. The map is gorgeous as it is. It's well designed and laid out. Just let its own colours shine. You don't need to put a filter over everything, man. It's ridiculous. But if you enjoy bagging loot, which I think you would in any payday heist, then you're going to be disappointed with fear and greed. There's not a single bag of loot in this heist that I could find anyway. Even in heists in payday 2, like Bullock's Mansion, where the target was to kill someone, there was still plenty of loot you could get as optional loot. You steal the stuff from the stocks. You steal the stock value and do the value exchange and all the stuff I mentioned, which is cool, don't get me wrong, but surely there should be a place to at least secure some bagged loot? No, I... I... It just feels like a very important part of Paley that is missing and the game clearly isn't built to it because you don't get the all bags IP bonus in this heist for getting all the money from the stock exchange. Surely you get it if you let the stocks max out, but you don't. The game doesn't really know how to respond when there are no bags, clearly. The only loose cash you can get is a bit of cash from a couple of safes you can open. And there's also a lovely office that is dedicated to the former CEO of Starbreeze, Mikhail Nurmark. And there's a hockey trophy in there that you can pick up, which has varying value depending on difficulty. I think the highest is $100,000. So that's great, but it's no bagged loot. And it's time for your favourite segment of a Red Arch Live review video, Editing Troy, cutting in with something he forgot to say, which is there is another known issue at the minute, which is in the patch notes, but I just want to share it anyway. The AI, when you're playing on your own, or I guess with other people if there are still AI will sometimes just get stuck on the roof of the financial exchange and so they won't come down with you they won't engage in fights with you and they also won't be able to save you from things like cloakers jumping you or tasers stunning you now granted there is a mysterious magic trick where when you're down you're suddenly magically revived but it's not before having the life kicked out of you over the course of one to two minutes by a cloaker if you have a full adrenaline set which I did in one of the heists I was playing so if that doesn't sound fun to you which it's not Maybe wait a bit until this bug and some of the stuff at the colour filters actually gets patched out because honestly, it's not the most fun experience right now with bugs like these. And as for the ending of the story, I mean, skip ahead if you don't want spoilers. I'll put a marker on the screen if you want, but I am extremely disappointed with the story, especially looking over it from the last year now. I mentioned a bit about the cutscenes don't really do much despite them being put together well. There's nothing going on in them. The ending of the year one campaign is just, so Concord's bankrupt. Let's lay low. And Dallas goes, no, let's not lay low. You heard the news. We're making it look easy. Let's carry on. And that's it. It's one of those kind of like left open endings. It feels a little bit like the ending of the first Transformers film. Like if you put that Linkin Park music on the background, it probably would have fit with it. You should lay low for a while. Ha, huh, you kidding? We're just getting warmed up. And like they said on the news, we make this look easy. We're ending here, but we could carry on if we want to, which is probably dependent on them getting extra support after March 2025. Who knows? But it just screams to me like the story was one of the last things to be thought about. And I know that sounds really mean. I don't mean it to come across that way, but it's just a bit dull. I don't I don't really like it. I would have loved Concord to play a bigger role instead of just being this guy that's mentioned a few times and then, oh, he's bankrupt's job done. I mean, even Dallas says in one of the cutscenes, I wish we could have killed him. I do too, mate. I do too. It would have made it more interesting if you'd been on the trading floor and you had to deal with him while bankrupting him or anything like that. Bankrupt his company and kill him. I don't know. Something like that would have been cool. That would have been a really nice execution of it. They don't even discuss retirement again. I mean, it's like they forgot they were brought out of retirement by assassination attempt. If they decided to stay in the life of crime, it would be very payday gang. I'd understand, you know, they'd be like, hey, you know what? Let's not retire. I miss this. But that's not said. So the story's just kind of like, yeah, we're done. Peace out. And I'm like, oh, all right. All right then. So yeah, I can't help but feel extremely disappointed by this heist. It was a very good setup in terms of the map execution and what you can do with the objectives, but the fact they don't vary at all between playthroughs, the fact the maskless stealth is a nuisance that's also somehow trivially easy, the color filters that throw you off, no baggable loot, a story that doesn't interest me. Anything that's really good about this also has something to weigh it down, which is a real shame. And I don't like being negative, but I don't really have a lot else to say positive about it. I, I think it's been let down by some very baffling designs 
design decisions, and I think it's a real, real shame. So in terms of recommending the DLC, I cannot recommend Chapter 4, Fear and Greed. I cannot with any good confidence say to you this is worth buying and putting the full money into. I would say buying individual DLCs is a good idea. In particular, the weapon pack for this update, it's fantastic. The animation team, the design team, everyone who's worked on that, fantastic. I'm sure everyone who works on the stuff even I don't like has done a great job. I think it's just, like I said, some decisions around it that I'm not a big fan of. The only other thing to note at the end of the video I will just put out is because the patch notes have been sent to us a little bit early just this morning while I'm making the video. And there are a whole heap of changes to weapon ammo pickups. So minimum ammo you pick up from a pickup and most amount of ammo you can pick up from a pickup. There's a lot of pickups in this sentence, as well as the total ammo for some guns. Most of them buffed across the board, including the Northwest B9, finally getting some of the love that it was promised. So that's nice. I'll just scroll those through on the screen so you can see the changes for yourself and pause if you need to, because I thought that was a notable change and you may wish to know. But that is everything to talk about in this update. I, like I said, I'm just, I'm disappointed. I, I, there's no other way to say it. I think, especially after the last couple of updates that have been really good, even if they've had their flaws, this one feels like it's got the most flaws going for it. I can't recommend the overall DLC. I can still recommend checking out the game, and if you haven't been playing for a few months, come back in now. There is plenty of free stuff, both from this update and previous updates, that's worth trying, even if you're not a paying customer past the base game. But it just feels like, especially after the game left Game Pass, is that push to be like, is it worth buying the game and buying these DLCs? I can't sit here and be a ringing endorsement for it. I, I just can't. I'm hopeful that October's update will do a lot better with the UI of revamp and server browser and whatever else they offer us, but... Right now, I don't think it's one of the better updates for the game, unfortunately. So I'm sorry for that. I know I shouldn't have to apologize for being a genuine critic and just giving my honest thoughts, but I think you guys know what I'm like by now. I don't like being negative about stuff. I know I had a couple of months earlier in the year where I was for Payday 3, but let's put that down to having six months with barely any content and I very quickly realized once people pointed it out and changed my ways. I'm just a needlessly positive person about a lot of stuff, so I notice when I'm not positive about something. So I'm sorry to end this video on a bum note, but there you go. That's my thoughts on update 10. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please do click the like button and subscribe if you want to stick around for more payday news and anything else that I talk about. And you can head over to my Twitch or my YouTube stream tonight at 7 p.m. BST where I'll play the update live. But let me know your thoughts on everything I've said and especially when you've played the update in the comment section below. I'd be very intrigued to hear your opinions. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all very soon in a new video. Look after yourselves. Stay safe. Take care.